So with uh, all respect and honor to the uh, holiness, the Mahasangha that is gathered here from many countries for this auspicious occasion. The honored and distinguished guests uh, here at the UN building on the 8th of May, I've been asked to give uh, the keynote speech on uh, world peace and sustainable development and the Buddhist position, the Buddhist uh, contribution uh, to these uh, ideals. So world peace, of course, is a is an ideal that we all long for. And ever since I can remember, uh, this has been the cry in the heart of most people I know, uh, wanting peace in the world. When I became a Buddhist many years ago, of course the teachings of the Lord Buddha challenged all the uh, preconceptions I had from my own cultural background. And one of them was uh, the world, the concept of the world itself. Because in, when I came to Thailand and uh, ordained as a bhikkhu, <clears throat> suddenly I had to look at even the language in a different way. Because in Buddhist terms, the world is not peaceful. Its very nature is change and it arises, it ceases, and that's the nature of, of the world. Now, to a Western mind, the world means the planet Earth, uh, and therefore we, we think in terms only of the external, uh, the world that we uh, project, the idea that we have of the world. <clears throat> and then we identify with our various positions, our various nationalities, uh, and the differences that we maintain according to our cultural, social conditioning. But when you contemplate the world in the Buddhist terms, then we begin to understand why there is a lack of peace and harmony in the world, because the world is very nature, is non-peaceful. Its nature is change, arising and ceasing, birth and death. So in developing Buddhist uh, meditation, the attitude was not to try to make the world peaceful, but to become one who is peace, at peace with the world. Now this is a, a change of perspective. And the, the secret to world peace is to be at peace with the world as it is. Now this might sound like a very passive thing to do, but a lifetime of monastic training, discipline, meditation, uh, does help enormously to recognize the cause of conflict and of suffering uh, that the Buddha pointed to so clearly in his first sermon. Now this first sermon is quite interesting to uh, the Western world because Buddhism approaches the religious and spiritual path almost from the opposite direction of any other religion. Uh, the Buddha taught about, when he, when his, he was uh, enlightened, his first uh, thought was that what he had learned, what he had seen through his enlightenment was unteachable. And therefore the very thought of going out and trying to teach about the truth, ultimate truth, or the Dhamma, he thought would be impossible. So when he was persuaded otherwise to go forth and teach uh, the Dhamma, his first sermon was about something so common, so ordinary, so banal, and yet so ever-present in every human being, every creature, uh, that has ever lived on this planet. And he took the, the reality, the experience of suffering, or dukkha, and placed it in a category of a noble truth. To a Western mind, this is very mystifying, because uh, 
we can't see where there's anything noble about suffering. The Western mentality is one who's always trying to get rid of it or escape it. Uh, and therefore, we're, we, our pursuit is for happiness. We want happiness and we don't want suffering. And yet the Buddha took the first noble truth and said, there is this dukkha or this suffering or this sense of being dissatisfied or ill at ease. And so this is a common reality that every human being can relate to. This is our bond as, human, as humanity. Because whether you're rich or poor, uh, you're male or female, whatever race, nationality, tribe, religion, past, present, future, suffering is a common bond that we all can recognize in our life. Now putting suffering in, into the context of a, of a noble truth means that there's something noble about it. And the nobility of suffering is, the Buddha said, is to understand it. So instead of just trying to dismiss it, run away from it, destroy it, reject it or deny it, the aim was to understand it. So this is the insight into that first noble truth, the understanding of suffering. And that's very much what we all need to recognize in ourselves. We, rather than just blaming our suffering on the world around us, on the society we're in, uh, or even on ourselves as personalities, we begin to relate to our suffering, recognizing it, admitting it, and understanding it. So the Buddhist approach towards peace is investigating, looking into the very nature, the very heart, the very basis of consciousness that each one of us is experiencing in the present moment. In the Western world, where I've been, I've been now living in uh, England for 30 nearly 30 years. So I've seen a, a change in uh, and an inter a growing interest in, uh, in uh, the Western world, especially in Europe and America, uh, in Buddhist meditation. And this is quite uh, a unique situation because 50 years ago, uh, when I first became interested in Buddhism, uh, I couldn't find anyone who had any interest whatsoever or any kind of understanding of Buddhism. Now, I'm from the, originally from the United States, and I lived on the West Coast. So I studied at the University of California in Berkeley. And there, even there, a very uh, important university in the States in the early 1960s, to find anyone who had any interest was almost impossible. At least I could not find anyone at all. So that led me on to uh, going to Thailand, <clears throat> try to find a teacher. Fifty years later, if you go to Berkeley, California, or San Francisco, you'll see meditation centers, institutes, ashrams, yoga centers, viharas everywhere. Uh, meditation has now become something that the Western mind has learned to recognize as something very, very important. Because in the affluent Western world, the suffering that, that we experience uh, is uh, the suffering of our own thinking. We, we think in ways that are very negative. We've developed our critical faculties to a high level, and those critical faculties uh, always go out towards what's wrong, either with oneself or with uh, one's own family or social group or nation or the world. We see uh, we, we're very good at discriminating and knowing how things should be if they were perfect and then feeling very angry, upset, discontented, disappointed with the realities of our lives uh, in the world that we experience. 
So meditation has become something that the Western mind has, is recognizing and respecting more and more. Now, the teaching of the Lord Buddha is a very clear teaching. Uh, the teaching of the Four Noble Truths is, a, is almost a perfect map. Uh, it's a teaching in itself that's quite complete. And if put into practice and recognized, then, of course, it, one has the insights into the causes of suffering. These are not strange, mystical, uh, difficult, or rare, or arcane insights. These are quite natural to us. So, what has happened now is that the Western consciousness is beginning to include a more Buddhist-like quality. And this, of course, the emphasis on mindfulness. Now, this English word, mindfulness, it's not a terribly good translation, actually. It's, uh, I don't particularly like the word, but that's what's commonly used. <laughs> Um, but it really means, from the, taken from the Pali, Sakti and Sampachanya. So, <clears throat> mindfulness now is recognized by many, many people in the West as the essential for awakening. Because the Buddha's teaching is a teaching of awakening consciousness to ultimate reality, to the Dhamma. Now, most human beings think they are awake, and therefore they, they live their lives with this assumption. But in terms of the world that they live in, we live in a world of illusions that we are used to. We can live in all kinds of dreams, fantasies, illusions, delusions that have been instilled into our minds through our cultural conditioning, social conditioning, and religious conditioning. And to us, that is the real world. And because other people don't see the world in the same way I might, from my cultural or social background, then we think they're wrong. We tend to see someone who disagrees uh, with my particular worldview as deluded or wrong. Now, my experience in training in, in Thailand was, was to... I had to deal with this a lot because being a foreigner, uh, a Prafrang in a Thai monastery, uh, I was the first one there, so there were no other foreign monks to talk to. So I had to kind of learn everything on my own. And of course what happened was a reflection. I began to see the, the grasping of my own views, opinions, my conditioning, my, my identities with my nationality, my race, my gender, the whole, the whole thing that had been conditioned through the cultural process of growing up in the United States for the first 32 years. After that, I, I became a monk when I was 32, so I started uh, examining and looking and investigating into what is reality? What is the truth? Now the, the thing that, the emphasis that the teacher, I, I lived with a, quite a well-known meditation master, Ajahn Tanajan Cha, and he's a very skilled uh, kind of uh, monk who could, even though for the first year we couldn't really hold a conversation uh, in any depth whatsoever because of the language problem, but the, uh, the way he taught, it was always pointing, getting me to look at my, what's going on in here, and to recognize the, the, what suffering is. You know, is suffering uh, monasticism? Is it the uh, mosquitoes? Is it the strange food you get in your alms bowl? Now, to an American mind, this would be suffering. You know, mosquitoes are the cause of suffering, strange food, hot weather, not knowing what's going on most of the time. You can always blame on the externals. 
when I began to see through the investigation of these Four Noble Truths, uh, my, how I created suffering, my aversion, my stubbornness, my conceit, pride, that I was in, that would influence my conscious experience, my reactions to the different uh, experiences and contingencies that would arise. Now, the mindfulness itself is has been a concept in English that has never really been properly understood. Uh, our conditioning tends to always want to define. We want to know through names and through definitions. And Buddhist meditation is not about applying names and defining terms, but in awakening to the present moment and developing that sustained attentiveness, attention or mindfulness, that is a quite a natural state. You don't create mindfulness. When you try to become mindful, you're not. So whatever you conceive or define as mindfulness, that's not it. But it's recognizable. So it's quite a natural state of being that's common to us all that we can not recognize, overlook, uh, not appreciate in any way because so much of modern life is based on trying to find happiness trying to find peace and harmony, trying to be successful. Where in uh, monastic life, as, as I'm sure all you bhikkhus, bhikkhunis can verify, uh, monasticism is not an easy, comfortable, pleasant, peaceful life. Uh, one has to learn how to, to surrender, how to let go of things, how to open to others, how to live, how to be harmonious rather than demanding harmony from others, how to let go of the very conditions that you create that cause disharmony. Like Sangha life itself is, is uh, for a Western person I think is a, is a very challenging experience because we're brought up to emphasize our individuality, our human rights, a sense of our self now, what I need and what I want is very strong conditioning of a self in, uh, in the Western world, in Europe, America, and countries of that type. Living in a Buddhist monastic sangha, this does not work to demand your rights or to think of yourself first. So the sangha life itself reflects these conceits and these attitudes that one uh, is experiencing in the present. From my own experience, I began to see the suffering I created around wanting things to be different, wanting the monastery to be something else, wanting monks that I was living with to be different types of people, not being content with what I had, but always thinking, uh, there would be a better monastery or a better place or a more quiet environment somewhere else. This very discontentment, uh, this critical mind, this, uh, this ability to always conceive of something better, I began to see as the cause of my suffering. Now the cause of suffering is, very, is based on ignorance, not awakened to the way things are or the Dhamma, but merely operating from avicca or ignorance. So in this term avicca, ignorance translated into English as ignorance, this means being ignorant of the Four Noble Truths, not having investigated, not having insight into these Four Noble Truths, then we remain on that level of avicca. So our lives tend to be merely repetitions of habits. Uh, we think, we we, we believe we're caught into what we call the sangsara or the seemingly endless cycles that just keep reinforcing themselves with, uh, until we awaken to them. So what, when we speak of mindfulness, then this mindfulness itself is the awakening ability each one of us has to the sangsara 
or to the suffering or the first noble truth or to the ignorance. Now the ignorance, the avicca, is, is where a, a desire arises and we attach to desire and then we become whatever we desire. So this becoming process is a blind habit that comes out of avicca. Now the Buddhist, Buddhist teaching is to awaken to this. We're not trying to destroy or, or get rid of the negative or the evil or the bad or the disharmony or the suffering or anything else, but to awaken to it. So this awakening is something that, that is hopefully happening more and more in the Western world. Fifty years ago, all of us, those of us Westerners who wanted to practice Buddhist meditation, we had to always come to an Asian country because fifty years ago there were no teachers or known teachers of Buddhist meditation, or very few, at least in speaking from my own experience. Uh, I could not find any teacher at all. Fifty years later, there are many teachers now living in the Western world. And teachers who have experience, have had insight, who are not just theoretical Buddhists, but actually people who have had insight into these truths. And so this, this kind of, this is another hopeful uh, sign of the present age. That there's an increase in, increasing awakening going on that may not be noticed on the higher levels of society or governments, but is happening. And this is very much due to the powerful uh, teaching of the Lord Buddha. Now, to, to, to the world, the history of Buddhism, its, its antiquity, it always seems like such an ancient religion. Because to our mind, 2,550 years seems like ancient history, like so long ago. And yet we find the Buddhist teaching so appropriate, so practical, so useful in modern society. In a country like uh, Britain, for example. This is a very modern country, well-run country, um, very secure, you can take a lot for granted, you can live very easily there and just take everything for granted. So in terms of, of uh, your, what's necessary for life and, and uh, security, uh, they're doing quite well actually. But still, the amount of suffering that you find in Britain is what is the, is in not amongst the poor particularly, but amongst the middle and upper classes. Now, this is the kind of anguish that arises from having a critical mind. When you have secu uh, financial security, <clears throat> you have your human rights guaranteed, uh, you have pretty much, you can get what you want or nearly, but there's always something better possibly that you could have. But still, no matter how much you might get what you want, this is never satisfied. You can't be satisfied with just getting what you want. And so this is becoming apparent in, in affluent Western countries. That this materialism that we found so uh, fascinating and so attractive uh, to us is now destroying us that a world just based on material luxuries, on, right, on, your, on human rights, on getting what you want, on demanding for yourself, this leads to one kind of sense of security. But what remains after all this is, is provided is still a very strong sense of insecurity because you're still unawakened, you're still living in a dream world or a world of delusion. 
And as long as that delusion remains, we're always going to feel this dukkha as, uh, as our experience of life. This sense of maybe dis-ease or disappointment. As you get older, uh, you tend to suffer from disappointment, from despair, depression, when the kind of enthusiasm of youth has, has disappeared. Because even having everything you want is somehow disappointing. You, you, don't, it, 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 you don't have the results you expect. You still have this dukkha as, as a common anguish, worry in your life. So there are an uh, increasing amount of awakened beings in the Western world and also in Asia, in Buddhist countries, where Buddhism oftentimes is taken for granted as kind of ceremonial religion or part of a cultural uh, expectation and custom. But also here in Thailand you can see the amount of stress that people are living with in a city like Bangkok. And this you find worldwide, that modern life, modern technology, all the wonderful, magical, technolo technological <coughs> uh, inventions that we can now get, almost every one of us can, can have for ourselves, still leaves us with this sense of worry and anguish and despair. So when we awaken to this, and this is what I find uh, in, in the UK, is that more and more people are beginning to, to awaken to this. They recognize you have to do something yourself. <clears throat> this problem you cannot ask the government to solve. It's something you have to open to and relate to, understand, and, and through that understanding you let go of the cause of suffering. Now this is a very practical teaching because it's about practice. It's not theoretical, it's not just some theory or interesting new psychology that's, that's come into, into the world. It's interesting in, uh, in England, for example, in, uh, I went to a conference uh, two years ago, was invited there as a keynote speaker of psychologists and psychotherapists. And, and the subject, their main subject, was mindfulness. And they wanted me, as the keynote speaker, to talk about mindfulness. I thought that was very interesting because, say, ten years before that, mindfulness was not a concept that the psychotherapists ever used. They were full of, like, talking about analysis and and, and used a whole different vocabulary. And mindfulness was just not something that seemed to play any important part in, in their way of talking about how to deal with human suffering, human problems. And so, two years ago, when I was invited to this conference, uh, I was quite inspired, actually, by the, the change in, in psychotherapy, psychology, psychiatry, because I find it moving even more into the, almost a Buddhist perspective. I don't think they would want to call it Buddhism because uh, they want to claim it, I think, for themselves. But, but anyway, this is, uh, it's interesting to see that the Buddhist teaching, which is so ancient, and the essential, the whole point, the essence, the pure essence of the teaching is mindfulness, is now coming into consciousness in countries where Buddhism before has had no influence whatsoever. So this is, to me, a very important contribution to world peace. Uh, I'm invited all over the world to, to many places that you would think there would be no Buddhists whatsoever. But... Um, there are. There are Buddhist meditation groups almost in every country in, uh, in, the, in the world. Now, sustainable development, this also is um, 
something quite natural to the Buddhist way of looking and experiencing the Dhamma. So we think of development and, and that means, what, what do we mean by that word? Now the Western mind tends to think of development as progress. Uh, the word progress is very prominent in the ideal in, in the Western mind. Like things should just progress. Life should get better and better and, and it should never get any worse. And we would like to, to sustain progress so that we have a continuous ongoing progress so that life just is the experience of everything getting better and better. But we, we began to realize that, that progress has, has its point, nothing wrong with it. But it also, where there's progress, there's degeneration. Two sides of the same coin, arising and ceasing, inhaling and exhaling. It's the pattern of conditioned phenomena. The world is like that. You develop and you degenerate. You're born, you develop, go through teenage, reach maturity, then you get old and die. And so this, this very common pattern which is so obvious when you, when you really look at it, when it's brought to your attention, uh, is not oftentimes given much importance or recognized because of the idealism of the Western world. Now we have ideals of how things should be, of a utopian society, a society where everything is what it should be. Uh, and so we can create beautiful ideals uh, intellectually uh, perfect ideals that we can inspire ourselves and others with. But the realities of our human existence are not ideals. We are not ideals. Human beings, none of us are ideal human beings. Uh, we are living, breathing, changing forms, conscious forms that feel and experience birth, aging, sickness, death. Now this, uh, if we compare this to the ideal, many people suffer in the West because of, of getting old. They see old age as a kind of uh, bad joke or a failure in life or something has gone wrong. Now this may not be consciously recognized, but oftentimes it's an attitude that, that life is all about youth and good health. <clears throat> and success. So then when the aging process starts taking over or you experience failure in your life, you go into depression, disappointment, despair, fear, fear of death. One of the big problems that people have is fear of dying. Tremendous uh, fear around that. What happens? What happens when you die? And people ask this question all the time. They want to know what happens when you die? Now I can give various ideas that people have told me about, but the reality is I don't know. I haven't died yet. I'm experiencing consciousness through a human form and it's like this. And I'm looking at the arising and ceasing, observing the feelings, the thoughts, the memories, arise and cease, the sensations through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, arise and cease in consciousness here and now. And so the Buddha emphasized this is all we need to know. We don't need to know everything about everything. But the teaching he gave, he referred to it as a handful of leaves, means that you don't need to count or know every leaf in the forest. Just the ones you have in your, the palm of your hand is enough. And that applies to, to each one of us. Uh, we learn from the way we are, the conditions we, we're experiencing, the, the, the emotions that we have, the characters that we have, the, the uh, physical appearance or the health or lack of health of the body. We learn from everything. 
the Buddhist teaching was about learning, understanding the way things are, not trying to define or create an idea of how it should be, but the awakened consciousness which is self-sustaining that we begin to recognize through what we call meditation. Now, sustainable development, then, for me, in my experience of, of uh, life so far, sustaining, sustaining the, uh, the development, the, the recognition of mindfulness, the reality of mindfulness, in which wisdom is, guides us. Now, this wisdom is pointed to by the Buddha in his teaching, so we have all kinds of useful uh, Buddhist uh, teachings from, the, from various schools of Buddhism, uh, wisdom teachings. But the teachings themselves are not wise. Uh, they're still words, concepts, ideas, conventions. They're pointing at wisdom, which is a reality, which is not personal. One can't claim it as some kind of personal attainment or achievement. But it certainly operates when we let go of delusion. So in this teaching of the Four Noble Truths, the whole aim is to let go, relinquish your hold on delusion. It doesn't mean destroying, it's not an aggressive or destructive act. It's merely letting go and realizing that what arises ceases. And in, when, when you allow the natural flow of consciousness to be the way it is, the cessation of conditions you can recognize. So this is the third noble truth. Nirodha Satcha. Recognizing, realizing the reality. It's the reality of cessation. When you really let go, then you, re you have that insight. Cessation should be realized or recognized. And then the fourth noble truth is developing the bhavana, developing the path, the way of non-suffering. So in this very profound teaching, but yet quite simple teaching, one has this pointing to suffering as a noble truth, the causes, the cessation, and then the ultimate realization of the path or the way of non-suffering. Now, in, uh, in the Western world, in, in, of course, everywhere now, it's an uh, international uh, problem, is that our economies and political uh, attitudes are one that are determined to create greed in the human mind. Uh, advertising everything around us is, is telling us that we should never be content, that we could always have something better, uh, that last year's model is no longer any good, and you'd be happier if you got the latest and so this is a strong condition we get through the television, through internet, through media of every sort, through advertising. So we're living in a society that is determined to create discontentment in the human mind. And this is what we have to live with, because the, the society at this time is like this. This is where it's at. Now, towards sustainable development, to sustain greed as an ongoing demand to try to perpetuate greed in humanity, of course, is taking us to destruction because greed is never, you know, it can be gratified in moments as, as poss you know, as the best we can do with it. You have moments of being satiated or satisfied, but then it revives. And so greed just goes on and on and on. And, and it's like the, the mouth, it just is trying to stuff everything into its body. 
uh, and never getting enough. We're actually becoming more like pretters or hungry ghosts uh, because of this insatiable uh, greed that is now created by our societies to encourage us to spend money. So, this we can awaken to this though. We begin to see, do we really need, we, we start investigating, asking ourselves, we start awakening, awakening ourselves to what do we really need for our lives? What is necessary for human survival uh, rather than just what do I want personally? Now as a personality, on a personal level, I'm a very greedy person. So it's, uh, you know, my personality wants everything it sees almost. So, so on that level, that's a very conditioned, uh, I see that as the conditioning of, of my mind. But beyond that conditioning, beyond that, then is an awareness of greed. And then the reflective ability uh, of asking myself, what do I really need? What is necessary for my life to sustain it? And then as a Buddhist monk, as a bhikkhu, what do I really need? What is necessary to sustain my life as, a, as an alms mendicant? Now becoming an alms mendicant was a, rather of a, a shock to me when I realized uh, after I'd become one, what I'd really got myself into. Because uh, suddenly I found myself totally dependent on uh, basic necessities from other people. I needed things from other people. I couldn't, I couldn't be independent and take care of myself. Now this is how I was brought up, to be independent, not to be dependent. And then joining the monastic sangha, I found myself totally dependent in a way that uh, was a bit of a shock. But I contemplated, what is this about? Why did the Buddha establish a monastic order of alms mendicants that have to depend on others for basic needs like food, shelter, robes, medicine? So this is like questioning, going into why, why did the Buddha establish an order, a monastic order, and this is probably the oldest monastic order still surviving. And you can see here in the UN Hall here, all these uh, summoners, uh, after 2,550 years, uh, it's still going. And hardly any other uh, institution from India 2,500 years ago can we, can we recognize as a viable form that works internationally. But then the monastic life is one of reflection, so you begin to see you don't need really very much. And also, Buddhist monasticism is, is a way of helping the society. It gives the opportunities for generosity, for connecting to the lay communities in a way that brings joy, happiness, and inspiration to our lay communities. Now in England, for example, where uh, most, you know, most of the population are not Buddhist, uh, even the non-Buddhist Britons, British people, love to come to the monastery. Uh, it has a peaceful atmosphere and the sense of offering food. This is, this is a, a practice that everybody enjoys doing. Uh, living in the UK for 30 years has not been an onerous experience. Uh, the, the four requisites have been in abundance. And this is, this is in a country that is uh, predominantly non-Buddhist. But people are generous. People are good. People love the good. And they, they do appreciate uh, moral conduct, good conduct, selflessness. And they see this in the monastic sangha. And, they, and it brings them hope and inspiration for their lives. So the Buddhist monasteries that I live in in the UK fulfill this role in, in the society. They do. They, they are play, physical places, actual locations uh, 
both our main monasteries are close to London or not far away from the main city. So we get people coming, uh, you know, all interested and inspired by the teaching of the Buddha and the opportunities to be, to, to go to a place they feel safe, they feel peaceful, where generosity is, is the word of the day. Now the whole basis of happiness in the world, the Buddha pointed to, is generosity. This, uh, this is a basic, uh, I, this is a basic characteristic of Thai society, is most foreigners are always impressed by the generosity of the Thais. Because Dana is so kind of ingrained almost in every Thai person, it's, it comes naturally because it's held up very high. And, and this is the very stable foundation uh, for living a happy life, even without practicing meditation. If one seeks happiness in the world, in family life, in one's working life, then generosity is, 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 a, is, a, nece is a necessity for that. Because selfless giving is joy. When, when, when we give for selfish reasons, we don't experience joy from it. Selfishness is, is a complete absence of joy. But joy is the reality of giving, of sharing what we have with others. And this is the very uh, kind of foundation of Buddhism. Then the sila, or translated into English as morality, this brings uh, a sense of self-respect. When we take responsibility for our actions and what we say, how we live in our societies, we take on the responsibility to do things or to be that in the society which is generous and kind, helpful, non-divisive. And we determine to refrain from acting or speaking in ways that cause harm and division to ourselves or to our families or our nation. So we, we take on. Now, sila has to be something that you ask for, you know, to force someone to take the five precepts is not a kind thing to do. Uh, the Buddhist, Buddhist teaching is always one of encouraging. Of inv it's an invitation. It's opportunity. It's, it's occasion for being good, for being generous, for being responsible. Now, these kind of qualities, then, of course, one develops a sense of respect for oneself. Now, in the West, in England, for example, people suffer a lot from a lack of self-respect. They, they, the mind tends to be so critical that they endlessly criticize themselves. This is, becomes an obsession, an, a cultural obsession of self-criticism. And so they demean uh, and, and insult themselves endlessly uh, over flaws or faults or even, you know, assume things that may not be true at all, but they just uh, are habituated to negative ways of looking at themselves. And so they lack self-respect. Now, I can speak from experience from this because I lack this self-respect, uh, but becoming a monk then, I started having it. Just the sense of being a decent person and living in a way that I respected uh, gave me a sense of, of respecting myself as a person, as a member of the society. So in Buddhist terms, the Buddha doesn't demand that everyone become a bhikkhu or a bhikkhuni. But the Buddha offered all kinds of possibilities for, for us to develop in ways that uh, we can at least live in the world with, with a sense of happiness and contentment and also a way to transcend the world through mindfulness and meditation. So this gives us the sense of fulfillment of our human life. The Buddha offers this in the end of a life, one feels a sense of fulfillment, 
of freeing oneself, of getting, being released from the selfish obsessions uh, that one had before. And a joyousness in being because of generosity. It gives us the self-respect and confidence uh, to take responsibility to live our lives in a useful and uh, harmonious way with our families, with our sanghas, with our communities. The sustainable development of mindfulness, then this will bring wisdom into our lives. And when we, with wisdom, then we begin to realize the oneness, ultimate reality, uh, where the differences, where it's a unity and diversity, as they, as they say these days, the sense of unity, of oneness, in which all the differences, class identities, racial prejudices, um, and so forth, all these problems can be resolved because everything resolves itself in the unity of our conscious moment. And so I offer this as a reflection on um, the Buddhist contribution to world peace and sustainable development. And from my own experience, I, uh, I feel incredibly grateful to be invited to give this keynote speech and also uh, to uh, the opportunity to become a Buddhist monk 40 years ago here in Thailand. When I asked to be a monk, then suddenly I found everybody, I felt everybody in this country wanted me to be enlightened. And I thought, that's really wonderful, because not even my mother and father wanted that. <laughs> so, being, uh, realizing the opportunity that, that was made available to me 40 years ago, following that through, then there is a, a joy in the life of being a Buddhist monk and seeing it as a, a genuine contribution to world peace.